Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Metaphysical Podcast. We've all thought about time travel ever since the Terminator and Black Back to the Future came out. But more and more theoretical physicists have been talking about how exactly time travel would be possible. And if it is, is there evidence that it's happened already? Well, that's where we dived into the research. We found the most amazing stories from modern times, history, religions, and some myths and legends that we wanted to share with you. Of course, some of these can be debunked, and some are just fun to talk about, but some just might leave you wondering what the real explanation is, because all signs point to time travel. So strap on your seat belts and turn on your flux capacitor as remote viewer John Vivanco and I, investigative researcher Rob Counts, start another metaphysical show that's out of this world. And are you listening to the metaphysical podcast or watching us on a video platform? If you are, please leave us a five-star rating and review. It'll help us reach more people than ever. And, and make sure that you like and subscribe. Hit that bell. All right, yeah. John, how you doing? Good. Good. Doing good. Hey, everyone at home. So uh, I have a new mic here that I'm trying to get set up. You might hear a little bit of popping throughout this episode, just as a heads up. So I apologize. I will get this issue fixed. Maybe not this or the next episode, but it will be fixed shortly. Uh, so anyway, just try to listen to the content and not any of the popping. So time travel, one of my favorite things to talk about. Oh, yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, actually, it's it seems to be an underlying theme here. Yeah. Well, actually, the technology is an underlying theme. I mean, really, it's like, what do we often go into on these episodes? We, we talk a lot about technologies and strange locations that can uphold some of these theories, ideas, and events that people have described. So, yeah. Yeah, and it does seem to be one. like a strange mix of natural phenomena and <clears throat> maybe even um, like organic and non-organic. Right. You know, combined sometimes like when, you know, we'll be getting into some of these projects that have kind of spawned some of the the time travel stories here, uh, you know, more and more in this episode. But I thought there was a recent um, time travel article that actually got my attention that uh, I wanted to bring up first. And uh, you got to listen to this headline, John, man through brick through window of home claim to be time traveler <laughs> oh god <laughs> it's all right so you gotta you gotta listen to this police are trying to figure out why a man broke into a home in marion county ocala police say daniel dinkins great name claimed to be a time traveler and that he threw a brick through the window of an ocala home earlier nice. this month to save a baby <laughs> sleeping in the room from some future event Oh, man. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Yeah, this is this is like um, what I watched. a I think it was a TikTok video not that long ago where, where somebody was claiming that lotteries, lottery programs are basically secret programs to find time travelers. <laughs> what? Yeah. I mean, well, think about it. I mean, it's kind of an interesting idea. I mean, heck. If you were a time traveler, wouldn't you like try and get those numbers and go back? No. And I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a you funny know what? idea. It does. That kind of makes sense. Right? Yeah, like, it does. Yeah. Because like who wouldn't go back in time and try to do that? I think it's funny, though, that this guy, after, you know, claiming to be a time traveler, he admitted to swimming in the victim's pool. Right. <laughs> Definitely yeah, something a time traveler would do, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I you know, the whole idea, too, of a lottery people going back in time to win the lottery. I mean, what's $26 million going to get you in the future? Maybe a sandwich and a cup of coffee. So I don't know how <laughs> worth it is. That's so true. But in that time though, you'd, you'd probably ball a little bit, you know, before yeah. you went back. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, we're going to be going over a bunch of stories that are not comical here of, uh, of real claims of, of, of time travel. And I think, you know, when you get into what we were just talking about, like the organic and the non-organic forms of time travel, you kind of have to talk about time dilation because yeah, it, you do. There's yeah. And I know John, like you, you have explained this to me before and I think it's really interesting. I think everybody at home should listen to you kind of explain what you've, you know, what you've experienced. Oh, well, time dilation. It's, it's part of the theory of relativity. 
that Einstein came up with. And it's basically, you know, part of it is that the faster you move through space, the slower you move through time um, for spatial dimensions. So, so basically, if a ship carrying astronauts was traveling near the speed of light, in one light year, everyone on Earth would have aged like 10 months. And then those on the ship would have aged like seven weeks, right, within the 10 months that everyone else aged. Um, and then the other side of this is that gravitational fields, they also produce time dilation effects. So GPS satellites that we have, this is a demonstration of it, they literally per day move like 40 to, five, 40 to 50 microseconds ahead in time. So GPS, and that's this is a gravity time dilation. So GPS satellites, they have to be calibrated to clocks on Earth. Otherwise, they're going to get too far into the future. I mean, you know, the, the other thing, too, is, is like wear on the materials is probably faster because it is in the future. It's a very interesting concept, right? That is. Yeah, right? So, you know, then you get into gravitational anomalies here on Earth, like, like we went into with uh, the mystery spot. And, you know, there is an idea about these mystery spots where there are these gravitational uh, anomalies where ancient people sought them out to pass through major Earth cataclysms faster because of the time dilation effect in those. Now, that, I mean, that's recorded, John, what you just said. Yeah, like, that's crazy. Yeah. I mean, that's that's the thought, right? That right. is the thought, right? So. I mean, it, it, it's it's interesting to me, though, because like if you're in a time dilation and there's a major Earth cataclysm going on, you're moving faster through time. That doesn't mean that the rest of the Earth is moving through through time faster, though. So it's like once you step out of the time dilation, I mean, do, does everything like go back to the regular rate and you just aged a bunch? You know, everything went goes back to the regular rate as far as the Earth cataclysm goes. And you just aged a whole bunch in that time dilation. I mean, that's, I don't know. Or it's does sort of like, um, age. And it's sort of like that, the movie Interstellar, right? I mean, yeah. where he's on a spaceship for a, a, a certain period of time, he comes back, he's still the same age, or he's aged just as much as he's aged on the trip. And his daughter is older than him when he gets back, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I you know, mean, this, this is all true. This is all stuff that happens. This is all truth. It's, it's based off the theory. And I, you know, I don't completely take the whole theory of relativity as being, right. because it's still a theory and there are aspects of it that have been demonstrated to be true. And that is a truth. Right. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, it dawned on me while you were, while you were talking, like if, if that's true, you know, with satellites and the microseconds and all of that stuff, we must be experiencing, we must be caught in our own time zone, so to speak. Like we're in our own time um, line, really. Because in the solar system, you have all of these things rotating. What it's like in the middle and what it's like at the edges of that must be affected by this to some extent. And then imagine what's going on in an entire galaxy that's spinning what's right. happening near the center and what's happening near the edges. And you, you could potentially run into imagine. Yeah, things are aging faster, moving into different, like into the future, into the past based off of masses that are creating these gravitational anomalies. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I totally think that this is true. Yeah. That's crazy. And, and, and I think, um, you know, with like a good, a great example was you bringing up the, um, you know, these mystery spots because, these scientists really are, they're not really paying attention to this conveniently. I think, you know, they've even kind of made it into a clown world where the, where the houses are built in, you know, a certain direction and all of this stuff. And it's almost like we're, we're making fun of some natural phenomena that is causing gravity to be distorted and, and then time to be distorted to some extent. So right. if that's happening on a small scale through natural phenomena or even electromagnetics or something like that, is it then possible to create or generate, you know, a more powerful version of this where you're either going forward or backward in time? I mean, 
I no, I totally agree. And I think this is probably part of the reason why a lot of government and military have have taken land uh, that are in power spots around the world because they're studying this effect and trying to figure out how to use it, how to ramp up the energy, mm -hmm. how to use it for their own means. You find that like like, for instance, around um, Mount Adams up in Washington state, there's a lot of very strange military stuff that goes on in the forests around there. And some areas I've heard of people saying that you'll find military people kicking you out of uh, forests that you should be able to go into. And why would they even be there? So there's a lot of very strange. I've even seen like a lot of low flying um, star lifter airplanes going over certain areas um, through the forest, which is very bizarre. A lot of helicopter activity. Um, so I do think that, that, that there is a huge focus on this. And I think they, they, on a certain level, they study where these locations are, the, not the gravitational anomalies, the electromagnetic disturbances, because these are going to lead them to um, locations that they can potentially take over and utilize. This is a picture here for everyone that's watching. This is a picture of Mount Adams um, in the southern part of Washington state actually pretty close to Oregon. Yeah. Yeah. It's a very powerful, energetic spot. Very powerful. A lot of claims of portals, um, a lot of UFO sightings, lots and lots. And, and lots. you know, the thing about that area is that it's, it's pretty remote. So you don't get a lot of people going through it. It's not a very popular national park. Yeah. And what you're looking at here in this photo, these bare trees, actually, there was uh, some type of um, it was fire, a fire. Yeah. Right. That actually happens quite a bit. Um, that actually cycles through. Uh, right. From what I was. Oh, yeah. It was explained that there's almost cycles of fires that come through and, and the then the woods kind of regenerate themselves over a, mm -hmm. a number of years and it kind of cycles through like that, which is really interesting. I had never really thought of it like that. Um, natural fires, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, um, yeah. And I think, um, you know, with these mystery spots too, um, if, if the electromagnetics <clears throat> or gravity or whatever is being manipulated and time travel, even to some extent is possible from studying this stuff, you'd think that there would be more people at the Santa Cruz mystery spot and there's not. Well, you've got, uh, who is Diehold? Um, what's his name? Vought. Last name, I think mm -hmm. it's V-O-G-T. Um, Diehold, his company. So he went and investigated it like we spoke about before. Right. And I actually just picked up his book on mystery, mystery spots. And it's it's full of the science of, of how he went about measuring what was going on there. And he's, he's, he's a scientist. So, so this is probably the only study that I've ever come across that deals with it in a scientific manner, which I find incredibly fascinating. It, it seems to me that, that this whole construct, this Barnum and Barnum Bailey circus construct around mystery spots, it, it basically shuts down any serious investigation into them. Um, so, so this guy, though, has done a really interesting job in the way that he's he's been measuring the fields and mystery spots. But the reason why he went about go measuring the fields is because most of his work actually has to do with what he believes is a coming cataclysm. And so I'm surmising like this is the only um, this is the only thing that I've ever seen him look at outside of that. So I'm surmising ultimately and little words that he said here and there that that he might believe that this is a safe spot during a coming cataclysm because of that time dilation effect, which, which also makes you wonder, I mean, with enough energy, and let's say you have enough earth energies flowing through, through there, if you've got some cataclysm, volcanic energy and whatnot, you, you got plates rubbing together, you're going to increase the electromagnetic energy. You might get even more of a time dilation effect. You know, when we get to places like the Bermuda Triangle, these things don't happen all the time. There are certain periods of year where they're going to be increased in, in force because you're going to have geologic conditions at play as well as um, space-based particles, the sun, 
maybe there's there's a solar storm going on that is going to agitate it even more. So in those moments when it agitates, is that when something truly opens up? And are these spots, locations where when everything aligns, pop, you can go into another dimension. I mean, this is this is probably how it works. And, and then you have the militaries of the world searching these locations out to see how they could fuel in extra energy to actually keep that thing open. It's the Stargate, right? Let's turn yeah. a natural mystery spot into a Stargate. I, I couldn't think stop thinking idea. of the movie Stargate when you were explaining all of yeah. that. Like that. That's, man, and that how probable is that? I mean, if, we're, if we can imagine that, Imagine what people or scientists with the abilities and means who can keep this stuff quiet are thinking about. I Absolutely. Mean, I feel like then, people have a hard time stretching their mind to think that way, but really, it, isn't that what would go on? I mean, I think so, you know, and yeah. then you've got, I mean, what's the technology? How far is the technology on black projects ahead of what we know? I mean, you got to consider that. Like, like they know how to do things. Go in, I mean, look, look at Montauk. They know how to go into the upside down, right? The, the place that gray craft slip in and out of. Applying that to something that's natural, I think you have a much better shot at actually and going what, through And something. what would you find? I mean, the anomalies that are already <laughs> occurring there would indicate that dimensionally, either the dimensions are, these dimensions are, connecting and or are closer to one another you know we don't know what that looks like in in another dimension i mean it could be well anything. okay so so for instance when we've looked at places like aramu muru lake titicaca mm -hmm. peru where there's this sort of a false door set into a cliff wall yep. that's been I remember that yep. shamans you know go to this place say it's a doorway to another world uh, and when we've looked at other locations, like when, where people have disappeared and they've gone, they've just disappeared and they're, they're, they're still missing to this day. We sometimes see that they went through a portal. You got electromagnetic energy going on. It's the same with our Amu where they, some people that have disappeared there have gone through a portal. It doesn't happen all the time, but it, but, but it appears to have to do, um, with an intention or focus that they need to have on where they're going to go before they go in. Otherwise they just sort of get lost in like what would be called the upside down from Montauk, which, you know, Montauk was that project out at Long, Long Island, I guess it was. Long, Long Island. Island, yeah, Montauk, yeah. Long Island. Mm -hmm. Camp Hero, um, Stranger Things is uh, TV shows modeled after that, uh, the events that happened there, in case you don't know. But, you know, these these locations, you know, we always see that that there has to be some kind of alignment. And even by the user, you know, you think of a person going through it as the user, they have to have focus intent on where they're going to go. And and literally some of these places could be a one way ticket to a specific location. Some of them could be just in sort of a washing machine upside down world. Or some of them could be focus related where you have to focus your intent like they did with Montauk. Yeah, and, and what's what's interesting and what seems to be a thread throughout a lot of our exploration in, in these in, in metaphysical and the podcast is that the power of combining um, intent with technology. Because at Montauk, what made Montauk different and special to some extent, you know, if you look at its predecessors, we're talking about, you know, things like um, the Manhattan Project which was largely science-based, the Philadelphia experiment, also very science-based, like cloaking, trying to make a ship disappear, Project Rainbow, um, all of that stuff, leading up to Montauk, where it was an, it was like you were, they were combining the more psychic side, like MK Ultra, um, remote viewing, uh, psychic, you know, um, experimentation with the technology to create events and when i say events i don't necessarily mean the scientific um version of that more like and it could have been but it's like we're they're tearing home they're tearing holes in time space they're going to other planets yeah. they're you know and and these are the reports right you have to look into this for yourself if you can decide whether you think all of that happened i can tell you for a fact 
there were very bizarre things going on in Montauk. If you cross examine what Preston Nichols book was talking about, what Al Billick with the uh, Philadelphia experiment was talking about. And then you look at what people on Montauk were saying about what was happening there during that time. And even after, and the things washing up on shore. Right. So definitely crazy happening. I know. You know, what did Preston say? Preston said that a lot of people got lost, which they did. They got lost in the upside down. And that's, you know, I got like what we've remote viewed. I got to say that Stranger Things is very is has a lot of aspects that they're very true to what what happened there. Um, You had to stay like in our data. It was like you had to stay very close to the doorway that you came out of, like when you went into the upside down. Otherwise, you would get lost. You could get shot. shot. You get stuck. Yeah, you get stuck there. And then um, when you get back to that Stranger Thing. Um, uh, screen cap that Lindsay showed earlier in, in, in the photograph, there's this monster, right? That, that big monster with sort of the mouth that opens up like a flower. Mm, yeah. I'm telling you, this is the stuff that we did see in remote viewing data, a very large creature, very large creature that was associated with the project that looked very, very close to what they've portrayed in the TV show. So, so, <laughs> Well, and and John, you know, I've done some deep dives on how detailed the Duffer brothers were in Stranger Things. And I can tell you, we're not dealing with something normal. Every single detail in Stranger Things down to the logos that they're using, where they're pulling from, they'll rename, you know, RCA to something else in Indiana and use the exact same branding almost as a hat tip to the original project that that was out there. That's fascinating. And yeah. They, they knew what happened. Like what that, that like down to the, what the monster looked like. I mean, we saw that exact thing in remote viewing. That's so weird. And it's like, that's what makes me feel. It's almost like, okay, yeah. Could the Duffer of brothers have created this themselves? Sure. Is it like, I've heard so many stories about guys like Steven Spielberg, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, all of this stuff, like getting briefed before he's making a movie on stuff that actually happened, you know? So when we, we're going to get into some stories here, you guys. And I think what's, what's interesting is a lot of the stuff that we're going and, and we're, when we're watching these films and these movies and these series, we're completely open to the reality that's in front of us. It's the only time we are when we go to the movies. It's why everyone likes the movies, right? When I'm trying to sell you on something being real in real life, you are going to have all kinds of things come up that stop you from believing that. But these stories, Close Encounters, for instance, you know, they're amazing to watch. It's, it's done in excellent storytelling, they may not have all of the details exactly right, but then the foundation of the story is so interesting, right? There's something real about it. And I think the side of us that knows, knows when we're watching. I really believe that. And that's why the movies hit so hard. That's why Stranger Things, for instance, is hitting so hard is it's excellent storytelling, but it's also a part of us is like, kind of wants to believe because so, there is you know, every yeah, exactly and every single person has intuition whether they know it or not right. and 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 i think that a lot of this stuff rings true in people that keeps them watching they're you know they question their own thoughts about it like no this can't be real but deep down they know it's real and that right. keeps people watching it and, it and makes then afterwards- it so that it is that much better than a completely made up story Yes. And then afterwards, they don't have to be like, oh, those guys are idiots for claiming that was true. There isn't any of that. It's a fictional story. So you accept it. Why do you think Philip K. Dick and his books like Minority Report were so successful in movies as well? Because, I mean, Minority Report was all about remote viewing. It was all about remote viewing. Every single thing that that guy put out was based off of stuff that actually happened in the future. That's so crazy, man. (laughs) I mean, talk about time traveling. You know, he was using, he was using his mind to time travel, just like remote viewers do. So there are different ways to time travel. And obviously Montauk, the camp hero, it, it was about a device ultimately. Now, I don't necessarily think that out there at Montauk, 
there were gravitational anomalies. I think they were creating them, you know, yeah. not, nothing natural. They were just able to create these things well, in order to use them as doorways to other dimensions, future and past. And that's why I believe they were so interested in that sage radar is because you could, right. you could, re you could recreate those things using frequency. Exactly. Frequency and electromagnetics could recreate some of the conditions that they could use to experiment, you know? And, uh, and so, okay. With that said, a couple of stories we're going to go through now. There is well, we could just like, we could just like, like chew on this forever. Yeah, we could, we really could. And, um, and there's so, there's so many actually out there. I mean, this one here, um, you know, some people don't necessarily believe this story, but it's still a really interesting one is a Swedish man claims he met his future self. Okay. So we've got an article from the India times here. YouTube channels have covered this as well, but basically this video shows a man standing next to an older man who looks like him and has the exact same tattoo on the exact same arm. He says he was trying to now this is a really this is a really weird story almost feels dreamlike when 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 I read it. So just keep that in mind. But he says that he was trying to fix his kitchen sink, but he couldn't reach far enough back. So he kept climbing further in. And then he reached an area where he could actually stand up and it was well lit. So this feels very much like what would happen in a dream. Right. Um, so then he reaches in. Uh, so sorry, he reaches an area where he could stand up and it was well lit. He, he sees his future self there and he guessed that he was about 70 years old. He had a cell phone with him, so he recorded the encounter. OK, so, you know, debunkers obviously say these tattoos look new or that it's impossible. Of course, some sites say it was part of an advertising campaign by an insurance company to promote the benefits of pension plans. <laughs> Either way, it's it's like a. Um, this idea of meeting your future self or meeting a past self seems to be reoccurring, not only in movies and fiction and stuff, but in some of these time travel, um, you know, stories that we're hearing from people, these accounts of time travel. Oh, yeah. And that's that's actually the biggest one of the biggest paradoxes about time travel, the grandfather paradox. You know, if yeah. you and actually, you know, this is this is why. So Stephen Hawking um the uh, scientist, physicist, I think it was theoretical physicist. He, um, he, he, uh, he understood and believed in time travel theoretically, but he couldn't bring himself to truly believe in time travel because of the, the grandfather paradox, because a whole can of worm opens up. <clears throat> if you start influencing past events, right. Um, that can decimate your own future. You know, you go back in time end up killing your grandfather and you're never going to be born. What happens to you? I mean, you know, back to the future dealt with that by Marty starting to Marty. Was it Marty? I think it was Marty. Yeah. Marty. Yeah. And where he started to disappear, you know, yes. because his mom fell in love with him. I mean, yeah, that's the, that's the grandfather paradox. So, so there's that aspect too, but I don't, you know, that, that was always so weird. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I think really it has to do with timelines I, you know, we've seen time travel as feasible and works and is happening. Um, but I think it ultimately does have to do with timeline splits as opposed to there's only one set reality. Uh, so, so I think it's completely plausible. Another interesting story here. Uh, we've got this on times now news and, um, and our Armenian immigrant Edward, he, he was working in a laboratory laboratory in secret. It's a government project that worked on technical inventions. They tested basically the new generation of touch screens to make people's lives easier. He says that tech we're using or will use. Um, oh, sorry, that's strange. He says that tech we're using or will use is already being used by the military way before the public gets them. Of course, we were just talking about that, right? And so he befriends a top scientist who brought materials to a secret workshop to work on a time machine. And the man said that if he was willing to be a time travel guinea pig, then he'd get help with U.S. citizenship. On May 18th, he accepted the proposal. Now, this guy Edward was given a special camera he'd be able to use to take photos in the future. He was sent to the year 5000 way ahead 
and Edward found himself standing on a huge wooden platform. L.A. was underwater after flooding, and people were living on the water. Global warming had melted the poles, and in this case, too much CO2 in the atmosphere had let too many sun rays, had let in too many sun rays, and there were higher crime levels and billions died. And Edward took a photo of underwater L.A. So, you know, obviously industry has had a huge effect on our Earth, regardless of whether you're on the you believe in climate change or not. It definitely has had an effect. So the idea that we could have polluted ourselves into a dystopian future is a possibility. Um, so many movies out there about that kind of thing. Um What's interesting? You know, we also go through cataclysm, cataclysmic events. I mean, you know, when you go back twelve thousand years in the Younger Dryas uh, time frame, um, the ice caps seem to have just let loose. No one was here, apparently. So they say no. There were civilizations here back then, um, but the sea levels were actually four hundred feet lower. So we go through these periods of of cataclysmic events. So you know. Ice sheets melting is not really a, a unsurprising thing What for whatever reason. Right. For sure. Okay, so um, I guess in this dystopian future that Edward was in, pure water was the main resource that was being fought over. Diseases and infections were common and quality of life was low. We don't know what timeline this was on. This is just his account. However, the people were mostly immortal because the civilization of humans was at the top of technology before the flood. So there was a flood. So a man that he met, Zach, said he was born in uh, 4002, I guess, and was still alive in 5000. Edward saw Zach. Oh, Edward asked Zach how the world leaders didn't predict the flood. And he said that in four. 4,028, the leaders of the world made a decision. Why spend so much money on humans? Why pay for their safety work, work, education, and insurance? Why spend time and life serving people if they have money, the power, technology, science, and almost eternal life to live? And they made the decision to just fly away from the planet Earth to another planet, to another galaxy, which, you know, is an interesting story and concept. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you know, sometimes these the the really really outlandish really outlandish stories are more believable, right? I mean, weird, super strange, super strange elements to them are the more believable. Um, it's true. I have problems with this as far as, you know, the the uh, CO2 climate change situation yeah. in the story. Um, a lot of events happen on this planet and have happened on this planet to cause major cataclysms that humans really have no, no control over. So who knows, you know, 5,000 years in the future too. It's, it's pretty far from now. It's like a lot can happen geologically. A lot. Yeah. 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 Like that's what Let alone, is he really a time traveler? <laughs> right. So yeah, if it was 5,000, it would be about what, three, about 3,000 years from now. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, anything, anything could happen. Will humans even be here, you know? And, and so, like, it kind of makes me think, like, let's say this is true. He did somehow go to a time in the future. Well, what timeline was that actually on? Because anything could happen. I mean, everything's yeah. completely yeah. open to. Exactly. Know. It's like what we were talking about before with the double slit experiment. You know, the, the, yes. the collapsing of the wave function. When you have the wave function there without consciousness, collapsing it it's displaying all possibilities and i think see a lot of this stuff i think a lot of the a lot of these these things they must have figured out a way to not collapse the wave function or they don't know whether they're collapsing it or not so i mean this is where you get into uh mind driven intent of the user right like that's like a huge thing with with yeah. with, with the time travel stories there, there's there's some aspect where the mind of the person engaged in it has to collapse the wave function. And what did, what did we see with, um, what did we see with project looking glass? 
And what did they talk about with that? Um, that we do know from a remote viewing perspective to be true, Project Looking Glass had to have a person that had a mindset or belief to go into that specific future. Now, if they didn't have that mindset or belief for that future or things that would lead to a future like that, then they wouldn't go there. That's, that's collapsing the wave function, right? If you don't know what the double slit experiment is, it's, it's where um, uh, they shot a, or you can, you can shoot an electron or a photon um, through a slit on a piece of paper, and that will just create one band on the back wall. Now, if you have two slits, um, this electron or the photon will behave like a particle as well as a wave, which is thought to be something impossible. It's, it's like, a, it's, it's gotta be black or white and for it to do both is very um, confusing, but this is subatomic particles. And so it will create a wave pattern um, as opposed to two slits on the wall because the, the light will interfere with itself. The photon will interfere with itself. To me, each slit in the double slit pattern is, is um, a probability, a possibility. Now, when you get a observer into the mix, the electron acts totally different, goes back to just going through two slits. It doesn't create the wave pattern. So that wave pattern is, is collapsed when you bring an observer in. The observer in the time travel experiments collapses the wave function, right? based off of their belief. It's interesting. It's like remote viewing, same thing. Future's never set. Yeah, it's hard to look into. So it would be hard because anything, anything can, it's not up to us really, right? There's something else going on. And sometimes it's important when you're at a certain point in time to be able to look at the potentials of the future to avoid whatever it is that you could potentially see. I mean, that's like what makes, I think, people love Star Wars so much in a way, is these these Jedis in training, seeing what could potentially happen if they join the dark side or whatever it is. You know, they have these premonitions. And, and there's, throughout history, all people have had all of these different types of premonitions about things that could potentially be or could happen. Some of them happen no matter what. Some of them can be avoided depending on, you know, what actions we take. So, yeah. I mean, it's a weird thing, right? Because <clears throat> with remote viewing, if we look at a future event, that event, event can always change. And the closer that we are in time to that event, when we remote view it, the more solid it is. But even the act of us remote viewing, it creates more instability in that future event. And then you have like people who are prophetic, right? With prophecy, it is more about that event actually happening, right? But, but psychics and remote viewing, it's, it's not like that. And so it's a very strange difference. And I've noticed that throughout all the time I've been involved in this uh, psychic remote viewing world. So that story that we were just talking about um, with the Armenian guy, that was uh, from Apex TV on YouTube, which says they're one of the biggest voices of paranormal on YouTube. And I guess they've been featured on Japanese TV as well. We're not really sure, like just you kind of have to do your own research on this, whether it's a hoax or not. Obviously, <clears throat> it's compelling because of the idea of, of being in a science lab and all of this stuff. But the, you know, like you were saying with the CO2 and stuff, that that part was a little bit a strange description of, of what was going on. So, um, yeah, this this next one that we're going to talk about, I find this is pretty, pretty interesting. We've got a mystery revolved around a century old Swiss watch that was discovered in an ancient tomb sealed for 400 years. Huh. And there's multiple things that are bizarre about this. Um, Swiss watch untombed, you know, this was sealed for 400 years. The size of the watch has to be the strangest thing. Um, it's like a ring watch. Yeah. It's so small. I mean, are we sure that's a watch? It looks like a watch. It 
looks like a watch. It's like a petrified watch. It's shaped like a watch. You know, but it looks maybe like, was it a mold that was like, you know how, I mean, you can create something that looks like a watch, but it's a ring and it's not obviously not a watch. I mean, trying to make a watch that small would be very challenging. The parts are so tiny. Um, but yeah, this was, this was found though, like that in a 400 year old sealed ancient tomb. That's crazy. So it kind of, so it's like a so some people think it's like a Swiss watch. Yeah, and you know, it's not like it was found in the Europe. It was found in in China. So it was a Ming Dynasty tomb in Shaanxi, China. It was discovered by archaeologists. Uh, like I said, it was sealed for more than 400 years. Inside they uncovered a miniature watch in the shape of a ring marked Swiss in English that's thought to be just a century old. The time is stopped at 10.06 a.m. And watches weren't even around in the Ming Dynasty, and Switzerland didn't exist as a country. The dynasty ruled from about 1368 to 1644, which is even weirder. So was the tomb, you know, exhumed and reclosed and no one knows? You know, people right. were interfering with the tomb. Yeah, but, but... It's, a, it's a ring. But it's a ring. So... Okay, so maybe it's something like this. Maybe there was a time traveler who who went back to that time during the Ming Dynasty and started to interact with the people. And the people noticed this, noticed this person had magical qualities. Could this be a god? And and it, and it, and the person was wearing a watch. So what they did is they saw the watch and they thought maybe the watch had something to do with his power because of time and time travel. So they concocted a little ring. They made a ring that looked like his watch, thinking that maybe that would give him the power of whatever this God had. Right. I don't know. I'm just making it up. Yeah. It's just really interesting to think about. Like, how did they get there? How did it get there? It just, it's a, that's a really interesting take on it. I mean, because if you did show up, if if a Westerner showed up in the Ming Dynasty with this watch, probably looking like he was a bit from the future, they probably would be either they'd pull weapons out on him, which could have right. happened. Right. And yet, yeah, yeah, you know, <laughs> we've got the, so Lindsay's pulled up a, an image of the Assyrian uh, relief art, which these. Um, bearded guys are always wearing something that looks like a watch, you know, which is, it's interesting anyway, but uh, yeah, that's, that's a crazy thought to think about, you know, that how that could be taken or, you know, whether, whether the tomb was, was actually interfered with, but yeah, um, 400 years. So, the, I mean, Switzerland wasn't even a, a country yet. Yeah fascinating that they found that uh little trinket in there and so it's you know this is this remains unsolved it's not confirmed that this is a hoax or is real at all and um some people think that it was a photoshopped image that fooled the world but i think that 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 was real whatever that ring was was real fascinating yeah we'll have to look into that one i have not remote viewed it but we'll we'll i'll put that on the list yeah, and I think, um, you know, from history, probably one of the most interesting and credible, I guess you could say, maybe time slips or interactions with a previous time that was unintentional was this story that we've told before on the show from Versailles, where two women were visiting the gardens of Versailles in 1901, when they found the people they encountered dressed in old clothing and hairstyles a man near a Chinese kiosk and a woman sitting and drawing. So they felt strange. And when they came out of the area, they were back in the present with no explanation. They wrote their accounts down separately, compared them and thought they'd travel back in time. They thought that the woman had been that they saw had been Marie Antoinette. Later, proof was found that a Chinese kiosk had been on the grounds in 1774 and that a bridge the woman crossed had existed in the past, 
but had not been found on any maps until two years after their experience. And there was more too. But that's really crazy because all of, I mean, the map afterwards, two years afterwards, they finally find a map that had this bridge on it that they were sure that they had crossed while they were there. Imagine walking through there and you just see this bridge. You start feeling a little strange. You cross the bridge. You see someone that looks like Marie Antoinette, a Chinese kiosk, um, which at that time, you know, China and France, probably people loved it. You know, it's crazy. You know, it makes me wonder, like, um, is this like a, like a super duper hardcore residual haunting situation where it's like, for whatever reason, the stars aligned on that particular moment and in, in the, whatever particular place they were in. Yeah, exactly. And, and caused this reality to mix with what happened in the past there where it's a residual haunting type thing. But I don't know, you know, you do have gravitational anomalies that move like gravitational anomalies that create time dilations don't necessarily stay in one place. They'll, they'll appear and disappear and move around. So that's curious. So I, I'd be interested to know like what else happens there on a consistent basis. I mean, are there a lot of ghosts there? Um, what's the geology like is the, does the geology, are they sitting on granite and is there water flowing under that granite piezoelectric effect. I mean, water's got a memory. Water carries memory of past events. Crystals do, granite does. So I'd be curious to know all that stuff because that's a really fascinating story. And it, for some reason, it's like, the, it's like what we were talking about earlier. Some of these television shows that you watch, you stick with them and they've got crazy ideas because you have an inkling something's true at base. This is one of those. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, you're, you you mentioned residual hauntings, and it, it's so interesting because even when there's a residual haunting at a house or something, and you can tell it's like it's the same thing just replaying over and over again, those entities that are replaying the same thing over and over again, you'll you'll hear people recounting those stories and getting their attention, and then they disappear. Like they'll look over you'll get their attention and then it disappears, but then it'll keep replaying right. over and over the next day, the next day after that and et cetera, et cetera. What's so bizarre about this situation is, is the, this the time being so strong, the memory being so strong that you're brought back into it as if you were there, right. which isn't typically ever described in a haunting where, you know, you walk into the house, the house is a certain way. It's not the house that you were in. And then all of a sudden you're back, you walk into another room and you're back at the same house. That never happens. Right. Right. So yeah. Yeah. The energy would have to be insanely strong over there to redo, to, I guess, create a situation where you could where you're in that world all of a sudden. Oh, right. Yeah. It'd have to be intense. I mean, I mean, we do like, we see this all the time in remote viewing sessions though. Like, like let's say we have a structure, a building in a remote viewing session. When we start to like probe that structure that we get, we can go through the past and we can see what happened at these structures in the past as well mm. as in the future. And, and there, there are like these, these hologram remembrances embedded in all structures. It's like, it's like they are cataloging all the emotions, all the events that happened within them. But yeah, like you say, there had to have been some intense energy to actually push that up so that multiple people saw this at one moment in time in the future. Man. It's like it's it's like just a, it's a, it's amazing to think about. It's one of those stories as a kid you'd wish would happen to you. But actually, yeah. that's the terrifying thing to actually have happen. And I think the fact that these women got kind of like a little bit ill when when this was like the, the atmosphere changed and they were feeling a little strange almost seems to add some credibility to the story because it's like there would have to be an enormous amount of energy to create something like that i mean that to me starts to sound like electromagnetic uh energy um, yeah hear a buzzing cause a headache make you feel ill yeah Here's yeah. another interesting story that's kind of similar and actually still reminds me of um, Interstellar a little bit. It's a it's an ancient Hindu um, story. 
So a king had a beautiful and talented daughter that he worried about finding a proper husband for. He took the, his daughter to the home of Brahma, the god of creation, to ask for help finding a suitor. They waited patiently, but when Brahma heard the king's story, the god said, the world that you knew from when you started your journey to meet me was long gone by. The people that you knew, the potential suitors you had in mind for your beloved daughter have all died and passed away. And so have their sons and grandsons and their grandsons too. He went on, time runs differently on different planes of existence. Roughly 113 million years had passed on earth while the king and his daughter waited to see Brahma. Brahma sent them back to earth, arranging for the daughter to marry Krishna's brother. The landscape, people, and everything had changed on earth. What's so interesting about that story is this is not the only culture that talks about ch time differing in different dimensions like that. Like Buddhism very much has stories very similar to this where time is described. Like basically in the paradise of ultimate bliss up there, according to Buddhist legend, there is like no time. Time travels, time, you know, is much different there than it is on earth. So you go there for a few minutes and it could be a thousand years on earth or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that concept is even in um, some mantras uh, in, in Zen Buddhism. Um, a thousand years can also be one second. So, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it but when you get into that, it's like the quantum world, you know, when yeah, you get into that, the quantum world, that's what it is. That's what it's like. It, it both exists and doesn't exist. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're, 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 we've are we got these boundaries of time around us right now. But when you go into deep spiritual places, those start to dissolve a bit and you see deeper into them what the reality truly is. And yeah. it's not what we think it is. No, usually, I mean, I would say never is. I mean, how, and how would you go from one dimension to another and not think there were going to be repercussions for that traveling? You know, like there always would be other to your body or time or just right. factors that you're not even aware of, you know, and and it's it's interesting because like with all the experiments that they have been doing, who knows how much like loss that they've had, like those people that got lost in the upside down or whatever it is in the Montauk project, if they were to then somehow find their way back maybe they're aged the exact same age but they've come back through the door and it's like right a thousand years in the future or something right exactly oh you know you think about this too it's like in in the ufo alien literature when you get to the, like the more extreme edges of it um you hear things like humans aren't built necessarily for space travel and existing in different locations through space but when you get to the gray alien type construct, physical body, those things were built for that. So they're able to traverse different locations and planets easily while humans would have a very hard time physically. So you got to wonder like, like, is there a physical makeup that works best for time travel that isn't human? And we don't even recognize it, right? Mm. What, what, like there, it could be in front of us all the time. And it's something that time travels, but we don't recognize it as such because we think only in terms of humans. Yeah. But maybe there's, maybe there's something that's physically more, it can do it easier than we can that can go through these locations, portals. I mean, we've seen well, it in some, with some cryptids. And I think that's probably potentially why, you know, I don't, I think the, it looks to me like if what is true about how they describe the alien bodies, that they're very fragile, actually. They're very thin and fragile bodies that that could potentially be even more susceptible to physical problems than a human body, theoretically. If that's true, this is the other side of that, right? If that's true, that's why the technology on the ships would be so important because if they're traveling through these dimensions and times, but they've neutralized the gravity around right. the field of the actual craft, you don't have that problem anymore, you know? And like, for instance, with humans, they have this ability to um, overcome those, like for instance, uh, seamen, they'll be sick for a month and then all of a sudden the problems neutralize and they never get sick on a boat again. Their body gets used to it. Their body gets used to it. Yeah. You know? It has resiliency. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I mean, you know, the other thing too, it's like 
if gray aliens and the lore behind gray aliens, you know, subduing people's mind, if they didn't do that, they'd get their necks snapped. Easily. You know what I mean? <laughs> All you have to do is flick their head and it's snap out. Know. Their heads are huge. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and there's one more story we'll get into. It's a bit of, we went a little bit over in this episode, but I think it's good. Um, so, pseudographical text from the Old Testament. Okay, now, this is actually sort of time travel in the in the Old Testament. God told Jeremiah that Jerusalem would be destroyed because of the impiety of the Israelites. Jeremiah show, follows the Israelites into exile, but falls asleep. When he wakes up, he's next to a basket of figs that has been perfectly preserved. However, they're out of season, and Jeremiah finds that he's been asleep for 66 years. So um, this is not... In the Old Testament, um, many people have in their Bibles. It's um, basically sued epigraphical, if, I, if I've said that correctly. So, you know, there's a lot of books and stuff that were not included in the, in the book of the Bible, but that were sort of the stories that were a part of the ones that were taken from. Um, yeah, so Jeremiah sleeps for... There's a similar story in Islam, actually, in the Quran. Jeremiah sleeps for 100 years, and his food and drink haven't aged, and he looks the same. Two different texts. Very interesting. And, you know, uh, Buddhist monks in China, they will sleep for decades in a meditative state and then come out and keep going about their business. So oh, yeah. it looks like, looks like they haven't aged sometimes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And meditation will point. do that. Yeah. It will absolutely do that. Yeah. Well, you guys, we're coming to the end of the first episode that we're doing on time travel and time anomalies. Um, we try to leave these stories open uh, to interpretation for you be, for a really good reason. And that is that if we're to, you know, go back to our discussion on time dilation, these things are absolutely possible. Whether these actual stories are true or not, I would recommend looking into those for, for yourself and just, you know, enjoying the story, trying to figure out for yourself whether they're true. There's a lot of reason to believe or not to believe. And, um, you know, we're not going to necessarily hate on anything, um, but that's this is what we found. John, what do you think? You know, I think I think that having a mystery is always a good thing. And I think that leaving some things open for the mysterious this is the best way to go. Absolutely. Well, you guys, thanks for being with us. When we come back next time, we're going to we're going to get into John Titer. And we're also going to get into some remote viewing that John's had on um, time travel and the Corona visor. You guys are going to love that episode. And we hope you all thought that this was as this episode was as out of this world as we did.